Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Sibley Auditorium. I'm glad that you all made it uh, today. Um, I've been forewarned that the Sibley Auditorium does get warm. And so I'm hoping that that's a comforting bit of news to you, <laughs> since many of you have come here through the rain-drenched uh, thoroughfares of the university. My name is Susan Hoffman. I'm the director of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, what we, which we refer to here affectionately as Ollie at Berkeley. Um, you are here now at the second of a four-part series that we're calling From Boom to Bust, Insights into the Economic Downturn. The sponsor of the series is the Vice Provost of Teaching and Learning, Christina Maslach, where the university balances the demands of research with those of teaching and learning. Um, our other sponsor is Rich Lyons, the Dean of the Haas School of Business. The Educational Technology Services, who you see here in the middle of the room, is recording today's lecture. And since this is a partnership between the faculty, uh, the dean, and the vice provost, um, we're not absolutely certain what we will be doing with the, uh, the webcast, but we will let you know by the end of the series. Um, I want to just mention that yesterday's San Francisco Chronicle had a variety of editorials uh, on the economy. And I'd like you to just be aware of those editorials were a part of a larger initiative that is happening on campus through the Bolt uh, School of Law. And it's called Blue Sky. And it's intended to capture the faculty who have served in government, um, who are now out of government, <laughs> but back in the university, to use their scholarly work and experience to propose to the Obama administration a variety of policy alternatives. And um, so look for it in the San Francisco Chronicle. They started the end of January and have been posting a variety of things, both in the print publication of the Chronicle and online. But also, more importantly, look at the university website for Blue Sky. And I think you will find a wide variety of very provocative ideas. Uh, yesterday's editorial by Barry Eichengren um, I can green, a colleague of uh, Professor DeLong's, who proposes a $2 trillion kind of line of credit through the IMF and World Bank for international trade, for import and export. And so I think there's going to be some fairly interesting ideas coming out of Blue Sky. Um, let me now introduce Professor DeLong to you. He will speak about. Um, he and, and Martha, only who was our speaker last time, um, have been in correspondence. He knows what was discussed last week, um, has seen the PowerPoint. He's going to take over certain areas which he found her, um, where she was not able to, to cover. He will begin to cover some of that in the uh, macroeconomic history. He's also going to be talking a bit about the international character of the economic downturn. And I uh, hopefully will have some suggestions around what might happen on a global scale as well in the recovery. Um, Brad DeLong is professor of the Department of e in, in the Department of Economics and has served in the United States Treasury Department as deputy assistant for economic policy under the Clinton administration. There, he worked on tariffs, free trade agreements, macroeconomic, policy and healthcare reform. Professor DeLong is also known for his semi-daily journal, an online blog called Grasping Reality with Both Hands, a fair, balanced, reality-based, and more than two-handed look at the world. Professor Brad DeLong. Okay. Now, I've more than been in correspondence with Marty Olney. She's four doors down the hall. And in fact, I just left her. She's in her office frantically typing right now for Econ 1. She says, hello. <laughs> um, now, how many of you people were here last week for, Marth for Marty? Oh, excellent. And how many of you are planning to be here next week for Bob? Again, excellent. I encourage those of you who aren't planning to be here for Bob to come and be here for him, because he is a true intellectual gem. Um, one of the great ornaments of our campus and of the kind of 21st century American intellectual world. We're extremely lucky to have him. 
Um, I've never gone to see him and not been pleased and exhilarated uh, and excited afterwards. What I think I should do today um, is pull back the focus or pull back the lens from what Marty did last week, which was to talk about the housing crisis, the subprime market, the collapse of housing values, the collapse of 401k values, and the gathering recession, um, and go all the way back to 1830 um, and all the way forward, hopefully to 2012, and also extend the lens, or extend the focus, so that we look not just at the United States, but at the world as a whole as well, um, and try to give the big picture, or at least the big economic picture, with the belief that Bob next week will then jump off from that and give the big political and political economy picture as well. Um, so let me start. Right? We stand here, um, we stand here today in the midst of what's going to be the worst episode of financial distress since the Great Depression of the 1930s, <coughs> and what's going to be the worst global economic downturn that the world has seen since World War II. Um, this graph we have up on the chart now, this is the civilian employment to population ratio in the United States. This is the fraction of adults of working age. Um, that is not including retirees, not including teenagers who still ought to be in high school. The fraction of adults of working age who have jobs, all the way back to 1950 at the left-hand side, all the way up to the present. Um, you look at this graph, and you see two big things going on in it. Um, the first is feminism. Right? from smack here all the way up to 2000. The share of the adult American population that has jobs jumps by seven full percentage points from 57% to 64% as women enter the paid labor force in much larger numbers than they had back in the old days. Um, when, say, Sandra Day O'Connor, graduating first in her class from Stanford Law School, could not get a private sector job in San Francisco right, as an attorney. The second thing you see on this graph are these things here. Um, the big, sudden downward movements in the fraction of American adults who have jobs that we call recessions. Um, that are all marked by the big downward pointing arrows. Um, this last unpleasantness, right, this current recession, is the last one of these arrows. Um, it's already approaching the size of the worst previous recession since World War II, the 1979 to 1982 Volcker Reagan recession. And all of our forecasts say that it's going to be bigger. Um, that a greater fraction of Americans are going to lose their jobs in this recession than have lost their jobs in any recession since the Great Depression itself. The fall in the civilian employment population ratio is going to be the biggest in 70 years. Um, this is a bad time to be entering the labor market. Uh, the people who are graduating from Berkeley this June have my sympathy. Um, and I graduated in 1982, um, which was back here, the previous worst time uh, to be entering. And this is a very bad time to be losing your job in the United States. And this is also a bad time to be entering the labor market or to be losing your job outside the United States as well. As demand for goods and services to buy goods and services in the United States falls, um, well, the United States has long played the role of the global economy's importer of last resort. If you're a country trying to develop or industrialize or to maintain full employment, for decades you've been able to rely on the fact that the United States acts as the balance wheel of the world economy and will be open to buying your stuff to help create employment for your people. Um, when the United States enters a big recession, its ability to be the global importer of last resort falls off, which means that American recessions carry the global economy as a whole down with it. 
At the very start of this year, my family and I were in Singapore, um, where, among other things, you can look off the south edge of Singapore. You look at the Strait, um, right, at the Great Strait, where the Indian Ocean joins the Pacific Ocean, a place that has been a focus of global commerce for at least two millennia. And you look out there and you see all the container ships and they are all empty and they are all waiting for business. And a year ago, that would not have been the case. A year ago, every one of those ships would have been crossing the Pacific or a much smaller fraction of them crossing the Indian Ocean. Um, so, um, let me start, um, let me start by saying that um, we economists are having a very hard time understanding or grasping or dealing with or figuring out what to say about the current recession. Um, because it is a very different animal than the recessions we had grown used to. Um, it is the recessions we teach in our, about in our textbooks, the recessions I teach about in Econ 101B that Marty only teaches about in Econ 100B and in Econ 1, um, they're a particular kind of recession that has been caused, or at least courted, by actions by the central banks of the North Atlantic world. Right? That all those recessions, um, the red-orange lines on this graph, um, all those recessions are caused when some large subgroup of the world's central banks, the Bank of England, um, the European Central Bank, the Federal Reserve, decides that its interest rate policy has been too expansionary, has been too lax and stimulative in the past, um, or decides that supply shocks to things like the price of oil are carrying the world economy's price level up too far. They decide there's the danger of a damaging global inflationary spiral, and as a result, they need to shift their policies from putting first priority on maintaining near full employment to recovering their credentials as guardians of price stability, as organizations that are focused above all at trying to make people sure that the general price level won't explode into some outburst of hyperinflation at some point and that you can count that prices next year and next decade will be roughly, give or take, two or three percent per year, more or less what they are this year. Central banks believe that they have to maintain their credibility as fighters of inflation at all costs, because otherwise we'll wind up with galloping inflation and we'll get nothing good in exchange. Which means that when central banks decide to make the price stability mission their highest priority, um, they go into the financial markets. They sell treasury bonds for cash. They thus shrink the amount of cash out there in the world economy. Um, they thus change the duration of the assets the private sector must hold. And thus the interest rate. Um, the interest rate which you can think of as the price that you have to pay for wanting your money now one, rather than wanting your money at some point two, three, five years from now, um, that the interest rate is the price you pay for having your money in some short duration rather than long duration asset, the interest rate goes up. And as the price of duration goes up, the value of all assets that have their value not in the present but in the future go down. And as asset prices go down, businesses that were thinking of expanding find that they can no longer raise the cash for expansion on profitable terms. People who were thinking of cashing out the value of their house find they can't cash out the value of their house on such attractive terms anymore. Because after all, most of the value of a house is that someone's going to be living in it 20, 30, 50 years from now. And so as the price of duration rises, demand falls, unemployment rises, wages and resource prices stop rising or fall. Um, in the words of Fed Chairman William McChesney Martin back in the 1960s, when the Federal Reserve shifts to fighting inflation, um, it takes on the role of the guy whose job it is to take away the punch bowl just before the party gets going. And according to my Berkeley colleagues David Romer and Christina Romer, um, also on Marty Only and my hall, um, who we've now lost to Washington, 
um, Christy Romer to be chairman of Barack Obama's Council of Economic Advisors, and David Romer to be something, I think, senior counselor to the chief economist of the IMF and child care provider to their one remaining kid who's not yet in college. Um, we've lost David and Christina Romer, but before we lost them, they did a study of the recessions in the post-World War II period. And they say this type of recession courting or recession triggering shift in priorities on the part of the Federal Reserve, um, that's the cause of six of the nine post-World War II recessions. That's what happens with the six downward pointing red arrows. Um, and these are the kind of recessions that we talk about in textbooks. Unfortunately, we don't have one of these going on. We don't have a red arrow, we have an orange arrow. Right? Neither the recession of 1960, nor the recession of 2001, 2003, nor the recession of today um, had their origin in a central bank decision that it's time to fight inflation. Um, they have their origins elsewhere. Um, let me see. Um, this is an asset price collapse recession. Right? This is a recession that's brought about not because the Federal Reserve has taken steps to raise interest rates, but because people out there in financial markets have suddenly gotten scared and are suddenly not willing to pay nearly as much for financial assets right, as they were willing to pay a year ago, two years ago, three years ago. Um, and where has that gotten us? Um, well, some rough numbers. Um, a year and a half ago, right, a year and a half ago, we had maybe $80 trillion of global financial assets out there in the world. You take all the pieces of paper that are traded on all global bond and stock and derivative exchanges, you add up all their values, taking account of the fact that some things have negative value because you've got to pay out money if you own them. Um, and you get something like $80 trillion of global financial assets 18 months ago. Today, um, today we're down to about $60 trillion. Um, we can summarize the determinants of financial asset prices as the result of five forces. Um, first, there's the par value, right? What the asset says it's going to pay you, right? Say if you have a $500,000 bond. The bond will say five principal value $500,000 on the front of it. Um, that's its par value. But assets almost never sell at par values. Right? They sell at discounts. Um, four discounts. Um, call them default, duration, risk, and information. Um, default discount. Um, well, a bond is a promise by somebody else to pay you money. There's a chance that when it comes time for the bond, when the bond falls due, um, your counterparty just might not be there. Or might be there, but just <laughs> might not pay. That they might default on their obligation. Second, there's duration. Um, that money in the future, even money in the future that you know with ironclad certainty is going to be there, is not worth cash in the hand today. Third is risk, right? Um, perhaps when you get your money from the bond or from the stock, you will be in a state of the world in which your marginal utility of wealth is low, in which you're relatively rich for other reasons and don't really care how much money you get paid off from this asset. But on the other hand, in the event you don't get your money, that's going to happen in a state of the world in which you're poor and would really like to have it. Money that's risky is worth less than money that's certain because of the chance that when you really want it, it won't be there. Um, fourth, information. Um, perhaps you lack information. Um, perhaps your counterparty knows something important about the asset that you do not. Um, like, for example, if a month and a half ago when the Bernie Madoff scandal began to break. Suppose someone came running up to you and said, I have $5 million on deposit at Bernie Madoff's mutual fund. Um, how about I sell it to you for two and a half million cash right now? Um, you know, um, this is why when one buys and sells financial assets, one should always ask the American question. Like, if this is such a good deal for me to buy the asset at this price, 
why is it such a good deal for you to sell it to me at this price? Um, that's something that most of the time people in finance, the financial markets don't worry about too much. They're too busy trading and earning commissions and having the excitement of watching their positions go up or down. But at times like right now, everyone focuses on information. And so every time someone tries to sell an asset right now, the natural response is, why are you trying to sell it? Is there something wrong with it right, that I don't know about? Um, these are the four things that mark, uh, that knock asset prices down. Right? These are the four factors whose changes have carried the value of global financial assets down from 80 to 60 trillion dollars over the course of the past 18 months. Um, now, of this, defaults. Um, defaults aren't the big deal. There's about one trillion dollars owed from American mortgage, uh, mortgage um, how homeowners who've taken out mortgages, about one trillion dollars owed to mortgage lenders that's not going to be paid. Right? People who bought $600,000 four-bedroom houses with no money down at variable interest rates in Vallejo or in the desert outside of Los Angeles who are simply going to say, this isn't worth it. We don't have any equity in this house anyway. It's too far. Driving down Route 80 is a real pain. Um, <laughs> driving the San Bernardino freeway is much worse. We're just going to mail in the keys and move back to an apartment in the city. And that means that there's going to be $1 trillion in securities that are mortgages or are backed by mortgages or in the stocks or bonds of banks that own mortgages that's simply not going to be paid off. Um, that knocks you down from 80 trillion to 79 trillion of global financial assets. The fact that American mortgage holders are going to default. Then there's the knockdown from 79 to 76 trillion. Um, the fact that we're in a recession means that a whole bunch of companies that were going to report profits and pay dividends and pay the interest on their bonds probably aren't going to. Um, current estimates are that that's worth another three trillion because the recession's biting all over the place. Last night, for the first time ever, I saw an advertisement on the television with which Toy in which Toyota promised to give you cash back on a Prius. Right? <laughs> Not something you've ever before seen. Right? Um, here in Berkeley, at least, the waiting time for Priuses has been eight months um, down on Shattuck. A dealership that I understand has sold more Priuses than any other dealership in the known world <laughs> over the past five years. Um, so that knocks us down from 79 to 76 trillion. Um, offsetting, that, um, offsetting that have been what the central banks of the world have done. That is, you know, Patricia at the European Central Bank, Ben Bernanke at the Federal Reserve, Mervyn King at the Bank of England. Um, that they've shoveled money into the banking system as if right, the day of the Lord were coming tomorrow. Right? They've bought every single government, short-term government security they can find and done a whole bunch of things that they had never previously imagined in an attempt to prop up the prices of financial assets by buying stuff back from cash for cash and guaranteeing things that they had not thought they would guarantee in an attempt to keep interest rates from rising. And as a result, they've pushed interest rates down. Um, they've pushed interest rates down so far that the 30-year Treasury bond, something that we kind of think should be paying a 6 or a 7% interest rate, now pays an interest rate of only 3.6% here in the United States. Um, that's reduced the duration discount in financial markets. Right? That's reduced the amount by which prices are less than par values because financial assets promise money in the future rather than money now by three trillion. And so that should have pushed the global value of financial assets back up to 79 trillion. But it's not at 79 trillion. We've lost another 19 trillion. We've had a 19 trillion dollar increase in the risk plus information discounts on the market. As everyone says, I don't want to hold any risky assets. I may well really want the money, and if I really do want the money, risky assets aren't going to pay me when I really want the money. And alternatively, I don't want to buy anything new 
because the person selling it to me knows something what's wrong with it and is going to take me to the cleaners. Um, so we have a brand new situation. Um, we haven't seen such extraordinary rises in risk and information discounts before. We have never before since World War II seen a situation in which a one trillion dollar shock. The fact that everyone recognizes that right now that they shouldn't have made all those loans on those mortgages in all those houses in the desert outside of Los Angeles in which a one trillion dollar shock to the value of world finance produces a panic that carries the value of world financial assets down by twenty trillion dollars. Um, the first order effect here, factor here, is not overinvestment in housing or default on mortgage backed securities, but instead it's a collapse in the risk tolerance um, of global financial markets. Um, that people who were very happy to hold these assets and these securities eighteen months ago are all of a sudden right, not going to, we're not willing to. And as a result, as a result, businesses that would normally be seeking to expand right now find they cannot get financing on terms that make expansion profitable. And um, because they can't find campaign financing, they don't expand. The contracting businesses still contract. And that's why the unemployment rate around the globe is screaming upwards to levels that we fear will exceed those reached in the post -world, ever before in the post-World War II period. Um, and so here we have a situation in which all of our economic theory and all of our models of the post-World War II world are of little use. Because we haven't had this happen before. Before recessions have been triggered by interest rate increases by central banks, and the central banks have not been raising interest rates, they've been trying as frantically as they can to lower them over the past right, two years. Um, so let's go to economic history, um, which I always like to do. And let's go back in time 165 years to the Palace of Westminster in the city of London, where the British House of Commons, under the leadership of Prime Minister Sir Robert Peel, the first Lord of the Treasury, was debating the renewal of the Charter of the Bank of England uh, back in 1844. You see, the Bank of England was the original entity that was too big to fail. It was the bank for the British Empire. The British Empire was the world's hyperpower. Rather than see the Bank of England fail or even see its credit doubted because it did all the business that the British government wanted done, the British Empire would stand behind it with its entire taxing power. Um, so Bank of England notes, Bank of England obligations, well, they were not as good as gold, they were better than gold because they were a lot lighter than gold and a lot easier to keep track of um, than gold. And so back at the start of the 19th century, um, at the start of the 19th century, um, the Bank of England began acting hesitantly and cautiously as a lender of last resort, right, when asset prices collapsed. Um, in the event that there was a big financial crisis and there were runs on banks and everyone was scared and people began running to banks to pull their money out, um, the Bank of England began adopting the custom of stepping in and going to banks and saying, yes, we know you're out of cash and there are still lots of people out in front of your bank who want to get their money out. Here are a bunch of Bank of England notes. We'll lend you the money you can pay off your panic depositors in Bank of England notes and come a month, two months, three months from now when things calm down, right, you can pay us back. Um, problem with this, problem with this was that it was illegal. <laughs> that is, it had become the settled custom that the Bank of England would intervene in financial markets whenever asset prices plunged too far and would act as the lender of last resort to make sure banks had the cash to pay out depositors who wanted their money, that it would print up and issue extra Bank of England notes. Um, but um, the problem was the Bank of England's charter gave it no power to do so. Um, and in 1844, the British House of Commons was debating whether the recharter of the Bank of England should give it such a power, because even without that power, the bank had adopted the custom. 
And in the end, Sir Robert Peel decided not to. Right? That if the speculators of London knew that the Bank of England would be there to lend the money, no matter what happened in a financial crisis, um, well then their fear of going bankrupt would not restrain their greed. Um, and thus protected by what we'd now call a Bernanke put, episodes of speculative excess and irrational exuberance would become much more common and much more disruptive because everyone would say, oh well, we don't need to worry about maintaining reserves or checking our, who we're lending to because the Bank of England will always rescue us. Um, but Sir Robert Peel wrote on June 4, 1844, the fact that the recharter of the Bank of England was going to make acting as a lender of last resort illegal did not mean that he wanted the Bank of England to stop doing so. Um, it may be, he wrote, that we have a financial crisis in spite of our precautions, and if it does, and if it be necessary to assume a grave responsibility, I dare say men will be found willing to assume it. And indeed, three years later, there was a letter from the Chancellor of the Exchequer, the Finance Minister of the British Government, to the Bank of England in 1847, saying, yes, we know we made it illegal, explicitly illegal for you three years ago to print up extra banknotes and lend them out in a financial crisis, but if you do it now, we won't prosecute. And please do it right now. Um, and they did. Um, my old teacher, Charlie Kindleberger, um, lecturing on this, remarked that this is the origin of modern central banking and that this idea of being lender of last resort is riddled with um, ambiguity, verging on duplicity. That one must promise not to rescue banks that get into trouble in order to force them to take responsibility for their behavior, but then one must rescue them when and if they do get into trouble, because otherwise trouble might spread. And when trouble spreads, it has consequences not just for the financiers who lose their money and not just for the depositors who lose their wealth, but for the economy as a whole and the millions of workers who lose their jobs as the result of a financial crisis, which then means that the businesses that ought to be expanding can't get finance on any terms um, that make it possible for them to do so. But, um, why is the lender of last resort function necessary at all? Um, why do financial prices suddenly collapse? Um, well, if you want to, you can cast yourself back even, even 250 years before, um, back from Britain in, during the debate over the renewal of the Charter of Bank of England, back to, say, Renaissance Venice, right? that of the docks of Venice. Um, where Antonio, the merchant of Venice, say, is loading his goods for a venture onto one of his ships. Um, he's loading the spices of the Indies, the silks of China, and the intoxicants of Arabia um, onto his ship in order to send it off for a two, a three, a six month um, expedition. But while he's there, um, his friend, damn, I'm blanking on the name of the guy who actually um, tries to woo Portia um, in the play. Um, at any event, his friend Impecunius shows up, says, my only chance of attaining financial security is to marry a rich heiress. Will you please, Antonio, my friend, give me a whole bunch of money so I can make a good show when I go to Belmont? Um, and if Antonio had been truly smart, he would have said, okay, um, and he would have pulled the goods off the ships and sold them in the market of Venice and deleveraged his portfolio, he would say now. Um, taken less risk and taken the cash and given it to his friend so the friend could go woo Portia. In fact, Antonio doesn't do that. Instead, he goes to the moneylender Shylock and promises the pound of flesh nearest his heart, etc., etc., and the play is off and running. But there's nothing to stop Antonio from if all of a sudden he decides that he wants cash to take the goods off the ship and to sell them in the market, and thus to turn what was the mercantile venture capital stock of the economy, a whole bunch of goods going from continent to continent on ships, into immediate consumption goods. Um, things that people like to smoke or drink, things that people like to wear, things that people like to eat. Um, now flash forward. Um, now flash forward from the Renaissance to the Industrial Age. Um, 
you know, that is in the Renaissance. Um, in the Renaissance, if all of a sudden you don't want to have nearly as much risky assets in your portfolio, right, if your demand for risky assets all of a sudden falls from the pink line to the orange line, well, by simply taking things off the ships and selling them in the market to people who are going to use them, you can deleverage not just your portfolio, but the entire economy as well and keep market prices more or less the same. You transform a chunk of your mercantile and commercial capital um, back into redirect consumption goods. Um, but now we go forward to 1830, um, you know, or today. Um, and the capital stock of our economy, well, it no longer consists of scarce and valuable consumption goods loaded into barrels and packed onto ocean-going sailing ships, some um, goods for which there's a ready consumer market. Instead, the capital stock of our economy consists of the equipment of applied materials. It's going to be located, loaded into semiconductor fabs. Um, includes the patents of Merck, um, the roadbed of CSX, a host of other things that are very valuable in their context as part of the social division of labor, but are not at all the kinds of things that command ready money at short notice in the consumer market. If the economy as a whole decides it wants to deleverage, if it wants to have less risky and more safe assets, some, well, what can we do? We can't cut up the rails of the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe and hand them out to everyone to whom the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe owes money and make them happy. What, what would you do with a nine-foot set of rail, uh, railroad rail in your front lawn? Um, very different from back when Antonio can simply sell off the silks and you can then wear them. Um, so what happens when everybody, um, or when a small but coordinated subset of everybody's, decides that they want their money now rather than in five or ten years, or that they want their money safe, that the world is risky enough, thank you, and they don't want to be exposed to any of the risks out there, or that they don't want to have to worry about information, about the fact that the people who are selling them risky assets know more about them than they do. And in normal times, when one investor decides that he or she wants a safer portfolio, well, there's someone else to take up the slack. But in abnormal times, you know, well, you can't turn the product, the equipment that applied materials makes and puts in semiconductor fabs into direct consumption goods. And so when the everybody's all decide they want liquidity and safety, um, well, the private economic system cannot magically liquidate the capital stock of the economy. And this is the key to what Paul Krugman calls depression economics. This is why the industrial business cycle emerges in the years after 1825 when the capital stock of Britain shifts from being commercial and mercantile to factories, canals, and railroads. Um, but why should everybody all of a sudden decide they want to hold wealth in different forms, in less risky, less leveraged portfolios? Um, well, first, um, Bad luck or excessive risk taking may have led to steep losses on the part of financial professionals who are now not trusted by anybody to competently manage your money. Bingo. Um, second, the world may suddenly have become a more risky place. Well, bingo as well. We didn't think there were chances of a recession bigger than any of the one in 1982 a year and a half ago. Right now we do. Um, third, um, Third, investors may simply have become an irrational and panicked herd. Bingo. Fourth, investors in the past may have been excessively optimistic, may have been subject to what Alan Greenspan liked to call irrational exuberance. And a long period of irrational exuberance may have led to a great deal of extra investment in fixed and organizational capital. Um, and so added to the total amount of risk to be carried in the economy. Um, and this added risk may be unsustainable at reasonable prices once the fervor of irrational exuberance dies away. Bingo um, as well. All right. um, and when this happens, financial asset prices collapse, as they have over the past year and a half, as all these four factors roll into action and the value of global financial assets drops from 80 trillion to 60 trillion, 
not because there was a huge amount of overbuilding in the desert outside of Los Angeles, but because the overbuilding in the desert outside of Los Angeles has triggered a shift in animal spirits, a shift in psychology from relative optimism to pessimism, which has carried financial assets down from 80 trillion um, to 60 trillion. Um, but then there's the question of why should we care? Um, it's clear why we should care if we're princes of Wall Street, right? If we're princes of Wall Street right now, we're probably bankrupt or near bankrupt. Um, and we're paranoid, right, and we're scared, um, so we care. It's also quite clear why we should care if we are retirees whose portfolios were reasonably, had reasonable amounts of risk. Uh, my wife and I are still in our late 40s. Um, our retirement portfolios have lost half their value right, over the past year. My former boss at the Treasury, Alicia Manel, director of the Center for Retirement Research at Boston University, just announced in her latest newsletter that she's going to postpone her retirement for five years uh, because she certainly hadn't been expecting this to happen. Um, and she's not a terribly happy camper. Um, but if you're not a retiree whose portfolio was invested in reasonably risky stuff, and if you're not one of the princes of Wall Street, um, well, if you're a 48-year-old like me, um, you say, gee, the reason I wanted this 401k was to pay my Medicare copays when I was 70, so the Medicare copays don't eat my house. Um, Robert Schiller at Yale assures me that stock prices always come back within 25 years. In fact, they always <laughs> have come back within 25 years. Um, and Robert Schiller's probably right. That is, the market unpleasantness of the past two years has altered our expectation of what stock market values will be when I turn 70 by only a teeny, teeny amount. If anything, the collapse in stock prices over the past um, two years has been a net benefit to me because since what I'm really buying with my 401k is wealth in 2030 or 2040 for me to spend then, well, all of a sudden, I can buy wealth in 2035 for half off. Right? They're having a sale on wealth in 2035, and so I should up my 403b7 and 527 contributions and so forth uh, because it's a potential steal. Um, if you're 70, on the other hand, um, and want your wealth now, it's a big problem. And even if you're not a retiree, and even if you're not a prince of Wall Street, it's a very big problem as well because, as I mentioned before, when the prices of risky assets fall, businesses that should be expanding can't, and so workers who lose their jobs in contracting businesses can't get jobs because there are no expanding industries, and the unemployment rate spikes, and state tax revenues collapse, and the state senate meets all night long in an unproductive session, and school AP and other enrichment programs are greatly cut back, and the world becomes an awful lot poorer place because a lot of people who should be working, who could be working, who ought to be working, are all of a sudden out of work and stay out of work for a period of one, two, five. In the Great Depression, it was up to seven years before the economy recovers. Um, it's not that we care about the princes of Wall Street, it's the collateral damage right, to the workers of America and to the workers of the world. Um, that's the thing right, to worry about. Um, so, um, we have a standard set of steps to attempt as a cure whenever this happens. Um, call it the four-step program, um, and the four-step program is carried out by central banks. The first is to reassure to have the chairman of the Federal Reserve trot himself out in front of the microphone and say the Federal Reserve understands the importance of being the lender of last resort and will not allow large-scale bank failures. Your money depositors is safe. You don't have to run to the bank to pull your cash out. Um, we're not going to let the thing turn into a full-fledged panic. So if you were thinking of believing that you had to get out of long-term risky assets and into short-term safe assets because the whole situation is going to go to hell in a handbasket, we won't let it. Um, second thing you do is you reduce the duration premium. Um, 
you say, well, we're going to buy treasury bonds and we're going to keep buying treasury bonds to push interest rates on safe assets way, way down so that people no longer care about the fact that some bonds pay off in five years and some bonds pay off right now. That by flattening the intertemporal price structure by reducing the duration premium, we're going to make it easier for those businesses that ought to be expanding to raise money because people will say, well, gee, this won't pay off until five years, but big whoop. Um, interest rates are so low that money in five years is worth very much the same as money now, um, provided it's safe, provided you're sure that it's there. Um, the third thing to do is to shift tail risk onto the government's shoulders. Um, to say, well, if you really are scared that things are going to be able to come a lot worse, the government is going to guarantee that if a business or a bank or an investment bank goes bankrupt, that we, the government, will find someone to rescue it or will rescue it ourselves. Um, if the American International Group owes you money, you don't have to worry and start frantically selling your own assets and pushing the price of risky assets down even further because you think AIG might not pay. We're going to take AIG over which led to that remarkable Monday morning when I woke up to discover that um, as part owner of the Federal Reserve in my capacity as an American taxpayer, I now owned an insurance company, the American International Group, which was very strange because I thought AIG was in the business of providing fire insurance and earthquake insurance and asbestos insurance and other things. And no, I find out that over the past five years, what AIG has done is it has entered the business of providing mortgage risk insurance to banks, um, saying that if the price, if people default on their mortgages, well, we'll sell you insurance against that eventuality. And that AIG had sold a huge honking amount of mortgage insurance, but had never taken a single step toward figuring out how it would actually pay off this insurance in the event that it actually had to. Um, so shift tail risk on the government's shoulders. And fourth, right, recapitalize the banking system. Right? That right now, everyone working for Citigroup, say, is absolutely terrified because they say one more bad month and we have to shut down and then we lose our jobs, my stock options become totally worthless rather than largely worthless. It's being associated with this thing as a big black eye. We, Citigroup, can't afford to take on any extra risk. We can't afford to loan to any businesses that want to expand right now because we're already on the edge of bankruptcy. Our equity value is down from 250 billion down to what, 20 billion um, today, 30 billion? It fluctuates. Um, and so we got to get out of the business of being a bank that lends money to businesses, or at least not expand our business anymore. Um, recapitalizing the banking system having the government take a whole bunch of the TARP money from last fall and actually shove it down the throats of banks and say, here, you're not going bankrupt. Now go out and do your job. Um, and the idea is to seek minimal effective interventions that will keep to get the financial system back into a state in which it does its job of providing financing on reasonable terms to businesses that ought to be expanding with the idea that um, we want these interventions to succeed because we don't want the unemployment rate to rise and for millions of workers in the US and tens of millions of people, workers outside the US to lose their jobs and not be able to find them. On the other hand, we want the minimal intervention because a side effect of this is that a bunch of feckless financiers who ought to go bankrupt actually begin to escape with some of their money all right, intact. Um, the chairman of Bear Stearns, right, um, Kane, was, I think, worth a billion dollars personally at the peak of the boom, last boom. Um, at the, if Bear Stearns had gone completely bankrupt, he would have been broke. Um, he had all his money in the firm. As it was, I think he got out with $75 billion because the Federal Reserve orchestrated the rescue of, or $75 million because Bear Stern, the Federal Reserve organ orchestrated the rescue of Bear Stearns. Um, and so his shares were sold to J.P. Morgan and Company for $10, um, which then led to Ben Bernanke and Henry Paulson getting beaten up for enablers of moral hazard and for people who 
cared too much about rewarding feckless financiers and not enough about economic justice. So then they let Lehman Brothers go bankrupt, which in retrospect people really wish they had not done so. Um, so you seek, seek these minimal effective interventions to try to keep the recession from getting large without transferring too much money to feckless people who ought to receive their just financial deserts of bankruptcy but won't to the extent that the Federal Reserve supports it and hope that does the job. Um, and so far, um, that hasn't worked. Um, and that's too bad because we were pretty confident it would work. Um, it's probably helped a considerable amount, although we economists will argue about this for decades hereafter, but um, it's pretty clear it hasn't worked. Um, so now we're moving on to steps five through seven. Um, step five is government spending. Um, you know, if employment is falling because the private sector can't create new jobs, well, have the government step up and actually buy stuff. Right? Have the government buy 500 billion extra of stuff over the next two and a half years and also cut tax receipts by 300 billion in the hope that that 800 billion dollars of actual stuff being bought will push employment up and get some businesses expanding again. Um, that's already in motion. It would have been very nice if we'd gotten that in motion last October or early last November. Um, Republican Party decided that wasn't going to happen. Right? That is the 50-50 tax cut spending increase deal to do the stimulus package was there on the table in October. Um, Republican Party rejected it. We just got it signed today. Um, it's going to do some good. I'm with the bunch of people who say it would have been better at 1.3 trillion and should have been significantly better targeted. That the part that's alternative minimum tax relief is going to do very little good. Um, the thing's too small, um, but it's a start. There is also massive purchases by the government of risky assets. I think primarily by um, taking Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac which are already government owned enterprises and having them buy up a whole bunch of mortgages that if the problem um, if the problem is that um, you know, <laughs> we have prices of risky assets are too low well if the government buys up a huge honking amount of risky assets and pushes the supply curve back right, supply and demand will raise the prices of risky assets and then businesses will be able to raise money on better terms when they want to expand and also the government might make any, some money off of the mortgages as well. Um, George Akerlof has been a proponent of the have Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac buy up a huge amount of mortgages plan for quite a while and he's certainly convinced me. Um, he's also on the same hall as Marty Olney and I, although I think he's now retired. Although I still have hopes of getting him back to teach the graduate students for two weeks this spring about the financial crisis. And if you're listening to this ever, George, how about it? Um, <laughs> you know, he being one of the true geniuses of our age. Um, you know. Third, um, you know, let me see. Third would be, the last step would be temporary nationalization of the banking system. Um, a step that Sweden undertook in 1992 um, when it had a financial crisis and that in the end worked quite well um, although there are differences between the United States and Sweden although we both speak um, Germanic languages <laughs> um, we both have lots of tall pine trees around um, some uh, some similarities, some differences. Maybe the United States' institutional culture wouldn't react as well. Uh, maybe it would. It's something that Tim Geithner as Treasury Secretary is creeping towards. Right? That his latest plan is to try to use the remaining money allocated last um, fall to recapitalize the banking system without nationalizing it. But in his last speech, there were a couple of comments about if banks fail their stress test, so we're no longer assured of their fundamental soundness. Um, we may get to temporary nationalization of the banking system. Um, will it work? Well, almost surely. 
um, that we face no insurmountable technocratic problems of policy design. We do face political and intellectual problems. Political problems we face are that Germany in Europe is not pulling its weight in dealing with this financial crisis, in large part because they're still scared of the hyperinflation of 1923 and 24, which had a big impact on Germany's financial and political culture. Um, and I'd also say that America's Republican Party is not playing a terribly constructive role right now. That is, had John, Cain, John McCain won election back November, a stimulus bill very similar to that that Barack Obama is signing today would have been moving through the Congress at about the same time. The balance would have been different. Instead of being two-thirds spending increases and one-third tax cuts, it would have been one-third tax cuts and two-thirds spending increases. But you know, McCain's inner economic cabinet, people like Douglas Holtz Eakin and Mark Zandi of Moody's.com, um, are as fervent advocates of a properly crafted stimulus as anyone over on the Democratic side. But um, we do seem to face intellectual problems as well. Um, and I'm not sure where those intellectual problems come from. Um, I'm playing with calling it an unholy axis um, of <laughs> Karl Marx, Herbert Hoover, and Friedrich Hayek. All people who said that um, the great line of tradition going back to Sir Robert Peel according to which you dealt with a financial crisis through all of these tactical targeted government interventions cannot work. Um, in Marx's case, um, well the argument that it cannot work is that what's going on is fundamentally a real side problem, a derangement of the structure of production, and you can't solve a real side problem overinvestment created by the internal contradictions of the capitalist mode of production with mere financial manipulation. Um, kind of a line that a whole bunch of people that Herbert Hoover and his Treasury Secretary Andrew Mellon made actual US policy during the Great Depression, which has been one reason why the idea has been underground for the past 50 years, um, that no one's wanted to repeat that at all, but that also finds um, intellectual support today. Right? And here I have two quotes at the bottom from very, very smart economists. Right? John Cochran at the University of Chicago, who has taught me amazing amounts about asset markets, um, but who says we should have a recession. Right? That people who spend their lives pounding nails in Nevada need something else to do. Um, and Larry White saying we have to have a recession right now because it's the price we must pay for unfortunate policies excessive Federal Reserve credit expansion, government mandates and subsidies to write mortgages to inappropriate borrowers, right, et cetera, et cetera. And as best as I can see, this is completely wrong um, because the problem's not mortgages, right? It's not the one trillion dollar of mortgage losses that has us stymied right now. It's the 19 trillion dollar collapse of asset values arising from the risk tolerance, the collapse of the risk tolerance of private financial markets that we must, and its consequences that we must now deal with. And I've talked for 15 minutes longer than I wanted to, as professors tend to do. So why don't I shut up and answer questions? <laughs> I have a microphone. If anyone, anyone wants to answer, ask a question. Right back here. I have an irrational question. Yes. Um, leaving all your economics theories and research and so on, I would like to get some sort of a gut answer. <laughs> Inflation. Yeah. Short term long term and I realize that it depends on what we do and policies that we uh, enact and how well mm -hmm. they work and so on. I'm asking for sort of a gut type of uh, response. Um, not a worry, right? Inflation's not a worry for the next two, three or five years. Um, whether inflation's a worry after that depends on 
a whole bunch of things, the value of the dollar, the speed with which the Federal Reserve rebalances its portfolio once the financial crisis is over. Um, but there are no signs that anyone should be worrying about inflation um, inside the United States. There are some signs that people should be worrying about a collapse in the value of the dollar uh, because, well, we can't forever continue to import a lot more than we export and the current value of the dollar is consistent with a continued large trade deficit as far as the eye could see. Um, but, you know, a large depreciation of the dollar, which we do, I think, have to worry about as a possibility, is a very different thing from a big burst of inflation in the United States like that we saw in the 1970s. Okay, next question. All the way on this side, I, uh, where the comment was that uh, Clinton, in essence, was the best Republican the Democrats could have elected. Uh, going on to WTO, uh, and a somewhat radical question about what you're talking about, economics and practicality, uh, would this not, in essence, be an inadvertent attempt to lower American standards of living so WTO could work? Uh, otherwise, how do you explain WTO working? It's not clear to me what you mean by WTO working in this context. Uh, in other words, without tariffs, with free trade, with, uh, let's say, whatever a worker gets paid in China, bringing the goods in here, how can the United States compete without either lowering its standards? Well, actually, just with, without lowering its standards. Um. Well, I think one answer is that the United States has been competing fine um, over the past 70 years right, as tariffs and trade barriers have fallen. Right? The United States' standard of living has continued to be among right, the very highest in the world, and the United States' level of manufacturing productivity has continued to be among right, the highest in the world. And, that the United States has run a large trade deficit, yes, um, but the industries that compete, or a whole bunch of industries that compete with imports have taken it on the chin, yes, and a whole bunch of reasons that specialize um, in those industries, especially the American Midwest, um, have had an absolutely horrible time over the past generation. Uh, but the rest of the country, um, the rest of the country has made a very good living selling the products of Hollywood, selling high-tech goods and services, and selling political risk insurance and promises of future bond wealth to foreigners over the past generation. Um, you know, so much so that, you know, well, you know, the appetite of the government of China for United States bonds chiefly because the People's Bank of China wants to hold lots of reserves in case the financial crisis of 1998 will come again. Um, that shaved an average, shaved an average of 1.5% off my interest rate on my mortgage over the past decade. Um, and that's 400,000 times 1%, that's 4,000 a year times 10, that's 40,000 bucks a year that has flowed to me as economic surplus from world trade. Um, so I don't think that the American standards of living need to be lowered um, in order for us to compete in the global market. And I do think that um, almost everyone else has it significantly worse than we are. Right? China is already talking about how the past year and a half has seen 20 million people return from the cities to subsistence agricultural work in the countryside. Well, by contrast, the unemployment rate in the United States, the unemployment in the United States has only gone up by three million, right, or so over the past year and a half. That the burden of this recession is primarily going to land outside the United States. And I think we have a, um, both a moral and a practical, um, say, obligation to try to do all we can to make sure that the burden of this current downturn is not borne unequally by people outside our borders for two reasons. Um, first, that chance and history have given those of us lucky enough to be in America a very good hand in the game of life. Um, and since we've been lucky, 
um, and have no greater moral status by version of having chosen the right parents um, than others. That I know there's someone in the Bengal Delta right now who would probably be a better professor of economic history at UC Berkeley than I would be, but he or she doesn't get the chance uh, for many reasons, one of which is they were probably protein deprived in utero to a considerable extent, which means that not all the brain connections were made. Um, you know, we've got obligations to them. Um, Trying to deal with the current financial crisis by focusing demand inside the United States by raising tariffs would seem to be not a terribly wise thing to do. And in the long run, um, in the long run, a century from now, the United States is not going to be the world's preeminent superpower. Right? A century from now, the world's preeminent superpower will be either India or China, or possibly both. And I can think of nothing worse for the long-run national security of the United States, I'm nothing worse for the world in which my great-grandchildren will live, than if the children of China and India are taught in school that at the start of the 21st century, the United States did all it could to shift the burden of adjustment onto Asia and keep Asia barefoot and poor as long as possible. Um, at the expense of maximizing its own short-run prosperity. That doesn't seem to me to be a smart thing to do. Next so. question. Yeah, you attributed most of the drop of asset prices to in risk and in information. If we look at equity prices, yeah. don't you think, or couldn't you attribute a lot of that to a, a rational discounting of future, a lowered view of future profits? Um, you could. Um, people do. Um, I think they're wrong, right? Um, that, what is it? Dividend yields, say, suppose dividend yields are um, 4%. If dividend yields are 4%, which is quite high, that means that fully half the value you get from owning stocks comes from profits and dividends that are going to be paid more than 25 years in the future. If dividend yields are 3%, then, um, then it's 33 years. Then half of stock market value comes from dividends and profits to be paid out more than 33 years in the future. Now, you can say recessions cast shadows, that they permanently reduce long-run economic growth. But a recession would have to, pass, it'd have to cast a huge shadow for the shadow to extend out to be 25 or 33 years out to permanently affect the growth of technology and prosperity and income 33, 50, 100 years into the future. And unless you think the recession's going to cast that long a shadow, um, well then you pretty much have to say, hmm, stock market prices are way down, but the reason they're way down is because the expected return on stocks has gone way up that people are demanding higher returns rather than people are expecting lower profits. I'm going to New York kind of tonight to discuss a lecture by Robert Schiller of Yale, who is brand new author with our own George Akerlof of a brand new book called Animal Spirits, um, which I think is very nice and very well done. As best as I can see, Schiller's estimates, which I think are better than anybody else's, are that the stock market decline of the past year and a half is kind of 15% lower rationally expected profits, 85% panic and reduced risk tolerance. Uh, and I trust Schiller on this. Uh, Professor DeLong, could we, um, could we take Professor Eichen Green's blue sky idea where he says that international trade is really something that we have to be keeping our eye on. Right. And in his editorial, he recommends that the IMF and the um, World Bank establish a $2 trillion line of credit of some dimension to support export-import. Could we hear your thoughts about this idea? Well, I, Barry, I, was, and I Barry just was on my dissertation committee. Uh, Barry taught me most of what I know about Sir Robert Peel and the origins of the Bank of England. Right. Um, Barry's also in the office next door to me, and we're teaching, co-teaching a course this semester. Um, if I want Barry to do his share of the grading of that course, I should be nice to him. 
<laughs> yes, I think it's a good idea. I, I think that keeping the wor flow of world trade going um, is an important thing to do in the course of this current recession. And that one of the lines of business that's having a very hard time getting financing right now is precisely the flow of international trade. And it's something that tends to fall between the cracks. Right? That um, the Bank of England's concerned about what happens to employment in Britain. The European Central Bank's concerned about employment in Europe. The Federal Reserve is concerned about employment in the United States. And none of them are focusing on um, what's going on with the global economy and with the international trade economy as a whole. That's the job of the IMF and the World Bank. But the IMF and the World Bank are right now, I think, considerably underfunded. Um, and so trying to get them more money so they can do their job would, I think, be a very good thing. Um, could you tell, I have um, a list of things I'd like you to tell me what role you think, if any, they've played in getting us into where we are today. Uh, flat wages. Um, tax cuts and borrowing, the Bush tax cuts in particular, dereg and deregulation, and, uh, which is to me sort of tied with people investing in what they don't understand. Um, I think flat wages for Americans below the 90th percentile of the earnings distribution, although a very bad thing over the past generation, hasn't played right, much of a role. That is, there are all these arguments that a more unequal economy is an economy that's more vulnerable to financial chaos and financial collapse. But it's always been hard to kind of close the circle and make those arguments both co coherent, consistent, and also terribly important. Um, so I don't think flat wages has played um, a terribly big role. The second thing you mentioned was the Bush, Bush tax cuts. Um, Bush tax cuts I don't like either. And they've made our situation a little bit more unpleasant right now because they've diminished our ability to increase government spending in order to deal with the recession. But once again, I think they're a second or a third order phenomenon. The one that's first order has been financial deregulation. That, as, um, as Alan Greenspan um, said, that he had thought that if only you made the financial market sufficiently transparent so that people had to bear the consequences of their decisions, then they would make good decisions and you didn't need to have a lot of government regulation. And as Alan Greenspan says, he is kind of flummoxed because his view of the world that he thought had served him relatively well for 50 years, it suddenly turns out not to be so good. That Bear Stearns CEO Kane, right, has a billion dollars at stake. Um, an unimaginable amount of money which he was planning to use in his retirement not just to enjoy the lifestyles of the rich and famous, but also to accomplish you know, pretty much whatever he'd want to accomplish in terms of philanthropy or investments or the startup of new enterprises or whatever, um, he lost $935 million personally because he did not maintain proper risk controls over the investments of Bear Stearns and company. What bigger incentive could you have given a CEO? Um, why wasn't it enough? Um, this, in fact, pushes us back toward, um, well, you know, a lecture I didn't give about you know, the antinomies of Milton Friedman. Um, about how, on the one hand, Milton Friedman always loved to say that the government is best which governs least, and that laissez-faire should be the rule of the day, and that whenever government intervenes in things, it, they're twisted to bad purposes. Why, for example, the government will then fire, say, young assistant professors named Milton Friedman from the University of Wisconsin during the Great Depression because some politician decides there are too many Jewish faculty members at the University of Wisconsin. Um, and uh, Milton, Uncle Milton, always said that private universities were better than public universities. And I think this played somewhat of a role uh, in his thinking. Um, you know, that. Um, 
politicians in the upper Midwest not seeing why cushy government job, why cushy public funded jobs at the University of Wisconsin should go to these strange people from New York um, and so forth. But on the other hand, Milton Friedman was absolutely firmly 100% behind the idea that you needed to stop large scale mass bankruptcies, that you couldn't have a collapse of the money supply and that banks that invested in excessively risky assets were a big source of such collapses. So on the one hand, you have Uncle Milton saying the government is best which governs least. On the other hand, you have Friedman writing in his program for monetary stability, um, a book that Tom Sargent at NYU made me read in graduate school, and I am very grateful he did, that it's very important that banks or that any organization that people invest or deposit in that they regard as good as cash be prohibited by law from investing in anything other than treasury bonds. Um, and you know, that's not laissez-faire, <laughs> right? That to say that if you regard your money as safe and cash-like, then any organization that, in which you put it has to invest in treasury bonds and treasury bonds only is a much more stringent regulatory straitjacket on the financial system than anyone um, today is advocating. Um, and I think in retrospect, we see that Friedman's program for monetary stability was, looks to be quite a lot smarter now um, than it looked 10 years ago when Phil Graham was deregulating and abolishing the Glass-Steagall and so forth. Um, you know, that there is a big place for financial regulation, um, if only because when push comes to shove, we then find ourselves with no choice but to regulate on the fly, and better to have regulated in advance in a more thoughtful way. We can do two or three more. Uh, are they going to kick us out? All right. Okay. All right. Uh, the title of your talk was Financial Crisis 2007-2009. Yeah. If you're going to give this talk in February 2010-2011, are you going to be able to fix the title of the course, or are you going to have to... Hope so. Here? Um, very much hope it'll be the crisis of 2007 to 2009. Um, I mean, it takes... It takes an awful lot of serial mistakes to have one of these things drag on for a very long time. Right? We have Japan in the 1990s and we have the United States, well the whole world in the Great Depression as the only two examples um, of things that have lasted for more than three years. Um, and hopefully we know enough to avoid the mistakes of Japan in the 1990s and of the US in the Great Depression so we can at least make our own original mistakes. Right? Um, so yeah, um, I'm fairly confident that this year is the bottom. Um, that by December either the private sector banking will be recovering on its own or we all will as taxpayers of the United States government own not just the insurance company AIG and the mortgage finance companies Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac will own Citigroup and Bank of America and Wells Fargo as well. Um, that they'll be public instrumentalities, um, choosing their loans according to public purposes rather than private doing the pri private industry thing. Right. This will be the There'll be two more questions. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Professor, for your talk today and wow. the extra time. And I wanted to get back to regulations and the idea of you know the international nature of this crisis and international regulations. And so I guess at the end of last year, uh, uh, Sarkozy and Barroso from the European Union came to, and spoke at Camp David and suggested uh, particularly that we try to regulate tax havens and hedge funds and I imagine now we would want to include, you know, the creation of potentially toxic assets, uh, you know, in the things that we, we should limit. Although I've heard some people say that uh, while this could protect us from the, the bottom falling out, it might limit the amount uh, that we could prosper. Uh, prosper. And uh, what, what do you th 
think about this, you know, paradigm of uh, international regulations and how what the best balance to strike is. Um, as to what the regulatory framework for finance going forward should be, um, let me say I'm conflicted about that which is why I'm very happy that Larry Summers has hired Jeremy Stein from Harvard to come down to Washington and think about what the regulatory framework going forward will be because Jeremy's smarter than I am and has thought about this more long for a longer time and will probably come up with better answers. Um, there are, um, as always, t economists, right, on the one hand, on the other hand, right, Harry Truman um, said he wished for a one-handed economist. Um, and then, you know, due to a mammoth photoshopping error, um, they think it was Newsweek um, over Christmas, printed a photograph of Barack Obama with his new economic team, which they had, were taking two different photos and then compositing them in order to make the whole panorama. And so Christy Romer was in both and she changed the position of her hands. So there's this picture in, I think it's Newsweek, it might have been time, of Christy Romer as the original four-handed economist. <laughs> Although there is a dispute between, among economists now as to whether the fourth hand is the hand or the ear of a bald guy sitting in front of her. Um, the resolution of the photo isn't too great. Um, so on the one hand, um, on the one hand, back in the 1920s, the United States had a system by which banks were not allowed to branch very far, certainly not across state lines and often not across county lines, which meant that it was genuinely difficult to get a mortgage because each bank lending mortgages thought, hmm, if the local economy goes belly up, not only is this mortgage holder going to default, but all the other mortgage holders in the neighborhood are going to default and everyone else is going to default. And we as a bank will be bankrupt. Therefore, we can't lend to anybody who might default in any conceivable eventuality because if one of them defaults, right, they all will. Um, and over the course of time since then, um, over the course of time since then, we've been allowing more and more branching and more and more diversifying, and more and more laying off of risk um, onto other people. Um, that is that um, the right way to organize world finance isn't to have everyone in Berkeley investing in banks that lend only to Berkeley, because then if something bad happens to the economy of Berkeley, everyone is in the pot. The right thing to have is to have everyone in Berkeley's investments diversified across the whole world. So that if Berkeley goes bad, well, at least Shanghai's doing well. And if Shanghai's goes bad, at least Mombasa's doing well. And if Mombasa's going bad, well, then at least Rome's doing well. Um, the idea is you diversify people's holdings of assets all the way around the globe so that everyone bears a tiny piece of every piece of risk in the world and so we as a world of 6.3 billion people collectively insure ourselves against all the local economic risks that you know kind of um, afflict the world and that way we can get higher and safer investment returns for all of us and also lower borrowing interest rates right for all of us and financial intermediation, the creation of derivatives, large-scale new lines of business like hedge funds, et cetera, et cetera. These were all supposed to be ways of doing that, right? That Bank X making a whole bunch of loans to Berkeley says, I don't want to bear the risk that the Berkeley economy will collapse because people will all of a sudden dislike tofu and chez panisse and flee and instead want to move to Midwest and eat cheeseburgers instead. Um, so I'm going to buy a mortgage insurance policy from the American International Group. And the American International Group was then supposed to say, hmm, if the economy of Berkeley goes down, we owe a lot of money. We'd better find someone else to take on this risk and go around the world to the savers of Mombasa, of Shanghai, of London, of Calgary, and so forth, and say, Psst, you want an attractive high yield piece of some mortgages in Berkeley. 
Right? And AIG was supposed to be doing the business of wandering around the world drumming it up, actually taking all these little pieces of risk and distributing them all around the globe so that we could achieve this world in which everyone had a diversified and low risk portfolio. And in fact, AIG did not do that. Right? Instead, they kept all the risk in house, um, produced model runs saying that they weren't actually holding a great deal of excessive risk. And then, as we say, there was this Monday morning when the Federal Reserve bought them up and we all found ourselves owners of a bankrupt insurance company. Um, similarly, Citigroup, right? That you know, Citigroup chairman, um, Bob Rubin, very smart man, very wise man. I saw him in operation a little bit when he was working in the Clinton administration. Um, he would, I would have thought, been among the very best people in the world to manage the risk of a large financial conglomerate. And yet he discovers when he's head of Citigroup that Citigroup all of a sudden has a lot more exposure to mortgage risk than he had thought because nobody had told him of these things called liquidity puts by which people lower down in Citigroup were promising to buy back mortgage assets that Citigroup had sold to people if they lost value. Um, and you know, the answer to this is, well, gee, you can't just sit in your office and think you know what's going on. You have to walk the trading floor, and you have to walk the trading floor enough that people forget that you're there in order to get a good indication of what your subordinates are actually doing. But you know, how can you walk the trading floor when you have a business of 300,000 employees? You have to have people to walk the trading floor for you. And then, well, how do you trust that they're actually doing it? Um, you know. Not something that I would have thought that Citigroup would be liable to. Um, so on the one hand, you want risk and diversification. On the other hand, things clearly got way, way out of control. Um, you know, now you can, say, um, you can say that Alan Greenspan and the regulators of his era were incredibly optimistic. You know, that William McChesney Martin thought the Federal Reserve has to play the role of taking the punch bowl away before the party gets going. Um, Alan Greenspan says, hey, wait a minute, this leaves all the benefits of the boom, all the benefits of diversification, all the benefits of sophisticated financial engineering on the table. It means everyone winds up bearing a much more risk and paying higher interest rates on their borrowing than they should. Let's leave the punch bowl out there because the Federal Reserve knows enough that it can act as designated driver and drive everyone home if something goes wrong. In fact, let's spike the punch with some grain alcohol for a while. Um, and, you know, I think Alan had reason um, that the 1987 stock market crash had no effect um, on the real economy. Bunches of princes of Wall Street went bankrupt. Um, the firm of Leland, O'Brien, and Rubenstein, run by, among others, Hayne Rubenstein from our business school, um, kind of lost its market share as them. But economy fine, Federal Reserve handled it fine. Um, Dot-com crash of 2001 actually produced $4 trillion in fundamental default losses. Actually produced was a much bigger negative shock in terms of assets that turn out to be worthless than the mortgage crisis has been. And yet, once again, the Federal Reserve as designated driver managed to get everyone home with only a very small recession. They managed to get everyone home in one piece. And now, kind of the Federal Reserve, the world economy is wrapped around a tree um, with Ben Bernanke kind of staggering around trying to figure out what happened and everyone showing up trying to provide aid. Um, it's not clear how to grasp the nettle, right? how to get all the benefits that we're supposed to be able to get from diversifying risks across the globe and allowing us to insure ourselves against the economic risks that afflict us all while not leaving us vulnerable to things like this. Um, but figuring out what to do is Jeremy Stein's problem, not mine. And for that I'm somewhat grateful. Thank you for your talk. Um, our book club is embarking on a series of readings on economics. We just read Elizabeth Warren's Two Family oh, Trap, okay. which yes. we found very interesting. Yes. So we're looking for books on that order that are intellectually challenging but not technical. If you have any thoughts, I'd be interested. Because we're right now writing our list. 
Well, for historical, I'd start with Manias, Panics, and Crashes by Charles Poor Kindleberger, uh, himself the teacher of Barry Eichengreen, the teacher of me, although I only attended half of one class by Charlie. Uh, Barry attended a lot more. Um, so C.P. Kindleberger, Manias, Panics, and Crashes. Um, there's also Paul Krugman's new book, The Return of Depression Economics and the Financial Crisis of 2008, is quite good. Um, Michael Lewis, who we know from Moneyball, right? And before then, Liar's Poker. He's writing a book, um, but when the latest twin the recession really became bad. He rushed out essentially his reading list for the book he's writing called Panic! Exclamation Point, which is not a book by Michael Lewis, but is a book of other things selected by Michael Lewis that he's found interesting while doing his research for his current book. What? It's an anthology. It's an anthology. It's a very nice anthology. It's called Panic! with an exclamation point at the end. I know, I tried to get them to search for it, at, to find it at Barnes and Noble, and they couldn't because I'd omitted the exclamation point <laughs> right, from the title. Um, so. Professor, thank you. All right.